Another part of that song is the gospel does what? It turns the earring or carries the earring back to the right. Right is meaning correct. The song assumes, and rightly so, that truth is objective, that it is outside of man, that it does not depend upon whether you're wealthy or poor, or male or female, old or young or middle-aged, whatever your status is, truth is truth and always will be truth. I've been amazed over the years as a preacher of the gospel and in visiting with other preachers and just knowing the brethren in general, how many people, it seems in recent years, are not that inter interested in the doctrine about whatever it may be. I ask myself the question, now why, why is that the case? Why is it that it sometimes, and not that long ago, People were very interested in what does the Bible teach. I want to be right, and I know the Bible will guide me back to the right. But I don't see that much anymore, even in the Lord's church. <clears throat> you used to walk into church buildings and somewhere in the foyer, there would be some size track rack, and most of the time it was full. I especially remember as a younger preacher, making it a point when I went into church buildings to check their track rack because it's some of the best teaching that was around. The very nature of a Bible tract means they've handled a particular topic very succinctly. And so I built quite a tract library. And it got so large that while I was at Southwest, uh, we categorized it and whatever and I gave it to them. And then another one, after that time period, I continued to do the same thing. And so I built up another one besides those tracks that we ordered because they're nothing but sermons in track form. Most of them were preached at one time, and so many people probably said, well, that was a good sermon that the preacher thought, well, maybe then it will do well otherwise. But guess what? You don't see those track racks in the foyers of the churches like you used to. In fact, many of the places where we would order tracks, where they printed them, they don't even have them anymore. You can't hardly find them. When we had, I don't know how many years ago that was, Ken, that we found out about these tracks that had come from a printer that had shut down, and they were all thrown out in the dumpster, and somebody saw them, all most of them at least, back to the church building and put them in a room, and we found out about it. And we made, what, one trip, I guess, and filled your truck up completely and brought it back here, and the remains of them are still here. But we gave those tracks to a host of people. There were a number of titles. And many of the people we gave them to said, we can't find these tracks anymore. Well, it used to be the easiest thing it could be to find those tracks. You pick up a catalog uh, put out by book houses operated by members of the church, and they would be there. Why? Things like that don't just happen. We say it's because they can't sell them. Why can't they? They did it one time. People aren't interested in doctrine. You have to be interested in doctrine before you ever want to look at the track. Even the title of it before it will catch your eye and say, we're oh, looking for one like that. I want to see what that fellow says. This is the influence of the secular age in which we live. Sometimes we don't think, well, it really had an impact on us. Oh, yes, it has. The materialism and the secular age. I've heard for a long time, even as a young preacher, somebody says, oh, he preaches too much doctrine. That never impressed me. It never impressed me at all, in, in a good way. I've even heard some preachers say, well, he 
It needs to get more off of that and down to something that has to do with more practical matters. Well, I wonder about people like that. What do they think the New Testament's here for? The word doctrine means teaching. And a sermon, if it's what it ought to be, teaches. If somebody said they heard a sermon and it didn't teach, they hear much of one. We sometimes in our comments talk about teachers teaching in a class over and against a preacher preaching from the pulpit. But it's all teaching, and it's teaching doctrine. And if it's what God wants it to be, it's teaching the doctrine of Jesus Christ and all of its various facets. How can you give too much time to doctrine, whether it's your own personal study or whether it's teaching it? If the sermon has no doctrine, it's simply not teaching what it ought to. Now, what did Paul mean when he said this to a young preacher almost 2,000 years ago? But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Titus 2 and 1. Well, he told him to speak. When you speak, you speak words. What choice did he have? Well, according to the inspired apostle, he's to speak what's called sound doctrine. Sound means the idea of wholesome. Doctrine is sound teaching, wholesome teaching. If I don't know my Bible, how can I teach anybody anything about becoming a Christian, living the Christian life? Sound doctrine stands opposed to false doctrines that abound and flood the religious world and too many times even in the church. The Bible speaks of both the singular and the plural form of the word doctrine. And you may never notice this, I think probably most have that have been serious Bible students for any length of time. When doctrine is used in the singular, it refers to the revelation of divine truth as the doctrine singular of God or the doctrine of Christ, Titus 2.10 and 2 John 9. But you'll notice this. When it's used in the plural doctrines, invariably it refers to false doctrines such as the doctrines of men or the doctrines of devils. Jesus in his earthly ministry said, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines, plural, the commandments of men, Matthew 15, 9. Paul had this to say in his inspired writing. He warned that some would depart from the faith. Now let me pause here and say this. You should note the various ways inspiration has referred to the teaching of the New Testament. To say the New Testament teaches this is to say the doctrine of Christ teaches this. Or God's doctrine is thus and so. Or, as Paul is talking about here, depart from the faith. There, The faith means the same thing as the New Testament system. And the same as Jude used it in Jude 3 when he said contend for the faith. Notice what Paul said. He said simply that some would depart from the faith, depart from the doctrine. How would they do it? They exercise their own free will. Now watch. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now think about that for a minute. Seducing spirits doctrines of demons or devils well it's man that teaches I've never heard a spirit teach me anything in the sense of pure spirit not material at all have you well if you think you have we <laughs> need to try to watch you a little more closely <laughs> what we need to understand is that 
what is being said here by the Holy Spirit through the words of Paul in writing part of the doctrine of Christ, the New Testament, is that the very source of false doctrine comes from Satan. But his instruments of spreading it are wicked men. It's not unusual that people who are faithful members of the church preach the truth. So God could speak from heaven and give us the plan of salvation. No people involved. But he didn't, did he? He didn't choose to do it that way. He chose, as we sang in the song again, the gospel has been put into our hands. God wants every man to be saved, but you can't be saved apart from God's power to save, Romans 1.16. And he expects the church to preach the gospel, God's power to save, to every creature, Mark 16.15. So he's made the spiritual body of Christ, his children, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. He's made it an integral part of saving lost souls. And if you're a faithful child of God, and all the Bible defines that to mean, you're part of the saving workings of God. We talked about good works this morning. Well, good works is putting into practice the truth of God as to how to live the Christian life. All that's involved in that. One of those is to teach the truth, is to defend the truth, is to be seeking souls that are lost, which most souls are. So when you read 1 Timothy 4, 1, that people would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, you know they turn from the wholesome doctrine, the sound doctrine that Paul told Titus to teach. And they, they're giving heed. Now you might say, why would they do that? Because I'm the captain of my soul. I can love what I want to love and hate what I want to hate. For those of us who've been around a while, I'm, I know this to be the case, especially as preachers of the gospel. I can think of many people in the church who on the surface at least appear to be very faithful to the Lord, always in the worship, always active, always doing this, that, and the other. But they apostatized. They left the faith. You say, why would a person do that? Because they were seduced. Well, they couldn't be seduced against their will. So it must be because something appeared to them more important than the truth. Thus, the Hebrews writer in Hebrews 13, 8 said, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Well, what do you have in mind? Different doctrines, divers. Strange doctrine, strange to the doctrine of Christ. This ties in a bit with Galatians 1. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema, let him be cut off. That's what God thinks of people who do not speak sound doctrine, but who teach false doctrine. Those in Colossae were warned against the commandments and doctrines of men in Colossians 2 and verse 22. I don't know what all it is, but if I know the genuine article, if I know that I know the truth of the Bible, and if I'm determined to evaluate all things in the light of God's word, I can recognize what's contrary to it. Any doctrine not of God falls into the fabric of false doctrines and all false doctrines no matter how insignificant they may seem to me falls under the heading of that which opposes the truth Jesus stated and you're well aware of this that I am the way the truth and the life John 14, 6. No man coming to the Father but by me. Well, you know, this being true, and it is, well, then you could uh, reasonably expect all teaching from Christ to be consistent. Man, it is. But don't expect all teaching from Satan to be consistent. 
One thing that error doesn't have to be is consistent. When we were in preacher training school, we would have debates. I told them, you can take any position you want to. But it's got to be that you're arguing for the truth from thus saith the Lord propositions. But I'll take the side of error on it. And I'll argue with that. You know why I didn't worry about that? Because I wasn't concerned about being consistent in trying to take the side of error in a practice debate. I can say anything I want to. And there they are having been taught to think, to think logically, to believe in truth to be objective and absolute, and knowing that all truth harmonizes with all other truth. And then they would make such a good effort, and then I'd say almost anything just to get out from the corner they may have been trying to put me in. And that would just upset some of them, not all of them. Pretty much so. False teachers don't have to be and rarely are consistent. Especially is that the case when the truth starts pressing them pretty hard. Then they're allowed to do about anything. So Satan doesn't have to be consistent, and he's not. Satan is the father of lies. There's no consistency in his fallacious doctrines which ensnare gullible souls. You know, when you look at police interrogation of suspects, especially somebody that's, that's guilty, but they're trying, to, they're trying to get the person to confess is what they're trying to do. And it is rather interesting on some of these tapes to listen to all of the things that comes out of those folks' mouths. And if they stay in that interrogation very long because they're not interested in sticking with the truth, they're interested in saying whatever they can say to get off, then they contradict themselves. That's the way it works with those who are not anchored in the truth of God's will. Satan is wily. Satan is subtle. He is a deceiver. No truth is in him. Thus he fabricates any false teaching that will trap men. Now I pause here and say, if you're a faithful child of God, who's interested in you more than anybody else? Satan is. I hear sometimes, sometimes people say, nobody cares about me. There's one, at least, he said, well, Jesus cares about you. Yes, I know that. But so does Satan. Never think about that. We sing the song, Jesus Knows, Jesus Cares. That's right. He wants you to be saved. He knows the only path to salvation. But Satan cares about you too. He doesn't want you on that path of salvation. He can say anything he wants to say. And since he knows us as he knows us, remember what Jesus said to Peter, Satan hath desired to sift thee as wheat. And according to that statement, the rest of it, Jesus prayed and stopped that right there. But that's what he wants to do there, one of us. False teaching is the way he's going to do it. But he's going to do it usually after we've already decided this or decided that, and then the teaching comes along, and well, that's, that sounds good to me. After all, it's condoning the sin I'm already in. Every fanciful notion that can win an acceptance will be found offered by the devil, every one of them. But the wholesome doctrine of Jesus Christ is always in harmony and never contradicts itself because it is the truth and truth does not contradict truth. Jesus said to the Jews, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. John 7 verse 16. 
So as God cannot lie, then his truth is going to be in harmony at every point. With him there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning, James 1, 17. This doctrine is not to be corrupted or altered, nothing added to it or taken from it. Paul said of it, and I've already mentioned this, but it needs to be embedded in our mind. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. In the Greek, that means the gospel of a different kind. It's very, very clear in the Greek. It doesn't mean the same gospel that Paul preached to them. It's taking them away from the truth. It means the gospel these Judaizing teachers are teaching is a different kind from what I taught you. You have two words in Greek. For kind, one means same kind. The other means different kind. As the old saying goes, the Greeks had a word for it. And the Greek never to have any problem when you're talking to him to understand that you meant this is a whatever of the same kind or whatever of a different kind. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. Let him be accursed, Galatians 1. Let that sink in on that accursed. In the American standard, it's anathema. The Greek is cut off from God. In fact, in the book of Galatians, there's several times there are plays on words because the Judaizing teacher said you must be circumcised to keep the law of Moses. Paul will even say in that book, I, were, I would that they were cut off from you. So you think they'll be cut off, let them be cut off from you. That's exactly what he's saying. And what he's saying here, who ought to be cut off, is the fellow who brings a gospel different from the kind I brought you. Paul can be rather tough, blunt, and pointed, and shall we say sharp. After that gospel, after that doctrine, after that teaching, after that faith was once delivered, what were they to do as we read earlier in Jude 3? They were to contend for him. They were not let it be tampered with. They were to make sure nobody bound where God and his word did not bind or loose people from what it bound upon them. But you see, this day and age, people aren't, that care, aren't, aren't caring that much. They'll say, oh, don't be so picky. Why do you want to be so picky about that? Well, I admit to you, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but it doesn't lead you to glory. the ways of death. Paul urged a young preacher Timothy to charge those of Crete that they teach no other doctrine. 1 Timothy 1.3 Well apostasy was already working at that time. And it was because of an attitude toward error. That some things just don't make that much difference. I won't read it right now but look at 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. Or rather, verses 1 through 3. 4, 1 through 3. Remember, Paul says, I charge thee before God, Lord Jesus Christ, to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Those in Ephesus, that's uh, 2 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy is, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, some shall depart from the faith. A point being, get my two scriptures straightened out. The point being, Paul was already telling Timothy the seeds of apostasy are so. Now, in 1 Timothy 4, he makes it clear. They speak lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with hot iron. But when he closes out in 2 Timothy, what does he sum it all up? How does he sum it all up? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But they shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be turned away from the truth and the fable. So when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, he warned of those being carried about with every wind of doctrine. Ephesians 4 and verse 14. All around us today, people are teaching all sorts of things and they're saying it's God's word. They're saying the Bible says this. God has not made it to where we cannot find the truth. 
but he means for us to be serious about finding it and learn how the Bible authorizes. We must be on constant guard, as Paul told Timothy, against any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, 1 Timothy 1.10. And again, our attitude, our frame of mind, is emphatically stated in 2 John verses 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth, the American standard says, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now he says, if anybody comes to you and doesn't bring this doctrine, you take it extremely seriously. Well, how do he say that? You don't have him in your house. You don't receive him. You don't even bid him God's speed. Here's why. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deed. So God does not allow his own to fraternize or buddy with purveyors of false corrupt doctrines. One more thing. You've only to look to the admonition and exhortation the Apostle Paul in his writings to those young preachers and elsewhere, of course, but especially Timothy and Titus. Notice how he puts it in 1 Timothy 4, 13 and 16. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Then you go down and he says, Take heed unto thyself. There is the beginning point with everything, whether it's elders or deacons or preachers or one becoming a Christian. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing so, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. First Timothy 4, I say, again, verses 13 and 16. Thus, we're back to what I mentioned a while ago. Preach the word, and you do it with all long suffering and doctrine. 2 Timothy 4 2. Also, read to Titus and all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine. Showing thyself a pattern of good works in what? Uncorruptness in doctrine, gravity, sincerity. Then he says, exhort servants that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Titus 2, 7 and 10. Now look at where Paul gave the emphasis. Do you think Paul would ever say, I'm tired of this doctrinal preaching. I wish you had a little more, whatever they call it. The gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. The New Testament system embodies that doctrine, that gospel, God's power to save. Somebody says, well, I just don't get that enthused about that. Well, whatever can get you enthused about it, you better get your enthuser turned on. Because I'm telling you right now, if you're not, heaven will not be your home. We ought to be enthusiastic about learning the Bible. More than that, about putting it into practice in our thought, words, and actions. If you're not a child of God this morning, believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God. And complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. The Lord will add you to his church. Therein you can... Put on the doctrine of Christ and growing up a Christian. A child of God, have you become tired of doctrine? Have you become tired of teaching? Do you spend much time with your Bible? Spend much time thinking about what the Bible teaches? You know, we do that with things we're enthusiastic about, we love. We spend a lot of time with it. And for the Christian to say, oh, I'm all there is, there ought to be for God, but I never read my Bible. I never think about what it means. I'm not too interested in doctrine. Somebody needs to do some serious from the heart repenting because they're lost.
you need to repent of any sin in your life as a child of God, we urge you to do so, confess those sins. We'll pray with you and for you, and God will forgive. So if you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.